All right, so welcome to week three of Chemistry 30, Learning at Home. Uh, this week, we're going to be continuing on with our applications of electrochemistry, and we're going to be talking about electrolytic cells. So far, we've been dealing with voltaic cells where the voltage is positive. So that means that the OA is above the RA in these cells, and the reaction is spontaneous. Now, these types of cells take chemical energy and they convert them into electrical energy. But sometimes we want to do other things as well. Sometimes we want to take electrical energy and convert that into chemical potential energy. For example, we can maybe plate a metal on a, another piece of metal. So we use electricity to plate something with copper or zinc. This is a larger electroplating process uh, where they're doing it on an industrial scale. Now in these types of cells, the voltage is negative and my RA is above my OA. So these are non-spontaneous. But that's also the reason why we need electricity. So we use that electrical energy to, allow, to force those electrons to move and allow the electrochemistry to take place. So we are going to be looking at electrolytic cells this week, which are non-spontaneous. So non-spontaneous. Oh, this crayon. And the E cell is negative. Now things that are similar between electrolytic and voltaic cells is the cathode is still the site of reduction. So it's still red cat, it is still an ox, so the oxidation happens at the anode. The strongest oxidizing agent is still at the cathode. My strongest reducing agent is still at the anode. So that is the same. The electron movement is the same and so is the ion movement. One difference is an electrolytic cell will not have a porous barrier, a voltaic cell will. The type of energy conversion is different. So in a voltaic cell, it's chemical to electrical. In an electrolytic cell, it's electrical to chemical. So most of these ideas are the same. So when we did Leora cat says Garo, no. Garoa cat says Leora N. Uh, that still stays the same. The only difference is that now we're dealing with non-spontaneous cells where the cell potential is negative and it electrical energy is converted to chemical energy. Okay, so here I have an electrolytic cell uh, and this is what we have in it. Now it's green because I have universal indicator in there so that we can see some of these changes with the pH. Uh, but I have two copper electrodes. In this solution is a solution of sodium chloride um, and it's aqueous. So we, one difference with electrolytic cells is there's no porous barrier. Everything is happening here. And we also need a power supply. I have a power supply over here hooked up to these, uh, and that's where we're getting this energy from. Now in the first half of the unit, we learned if we only have reactants, we can get the reactions that happen by identifying the strongest OA and the strongest RA. So my strongest RA, when I list everything that's present, so I have copper, I have sodium ions, chloride ions, and then they're, in, they're aqueous, so I also have H2O. My strongest reducing agent on my chart is copper, and my strongest oxidizing agent is water. My strongest reducing agent undergoes oxidation, and that happens at the anode. So at the anode, I should have copper forming copper 2 plus ions. It's going to be hard to see in here, but if it were clear, this should be, this is just copper, but we should be forming this blue ion in the solution. At the cathode, where reduction is happening, water is gaining electrons and it's forming hydrogen gas and hydroxide. So one way we could identify which one's the cathode is there should be bubbles because there's a gas produced and the pH should be going up. So universal indicators should be getting more purple. Now this is an electrolytic cell, so now my OA is below my RA, which means it's non-spontaneous. When I calculate the E cell, which is still cathode, 
minus anode, I get a voltage of negative 0.17 volts. So I have my power supply here. It's set at 0.7 volts. If I put that in there, there's not really anything happening in terms of a chemical reaction. However, if I crank it up past 1.7, so now it's for something, and I put that in there, now you'll see that actually chemistry is starting to happen. So I need at least that minimum voltage for the reaction to occur. You'll notice that at this one that's getting purple, so this one's turning more purple, uh, that's probably my cathode. Well, it is my cathode. And I also see that there's bubbles being formed on this electrode. So when I was looking at the, the one that's turning purple, uh, there's also bubbles that are being formed. Those bubbles are hydrogen gas. And it's turning purple because it's getting more basic. So my cathode again, it's producing H2 and hydroxide ions. That's this purple one. I know that this is my cathode. My anode is this other one. Uh, so that's kind of how minimum voltage applies. So if I'm below that voltage, nothing happens. I need to go above that in order for the chemistry to happen. These things that happen, we can identify uh, using some of these things that we can observe, like bubbles or a changing pH uh, or a colored ion being produced. We still use the same things we have in the first unit. So we identify our strongest OA and our strongest RA. Our strongest RA is oxidized at the anode. Our strongest OA is reduced at the cathode. Now my cathode is still this, this copper electrode. This is my cathode. It's the site of reduction. This is my anode. This is the site of oxidation. Here's an example, another example of a cell where we have a cobalt two chloride solution and lead electrodes. Uh, we want to identify the reactions that occur at the cathode and the anode and the minimum voltage, so the voltage that's needed for this cell to work. So just like in the previous example, we list everything that we have present. So we have lead, we have cobalt ions, we have chloride ions, and because we have a solution, we also need to include H2O. It is important, especially for these electrolytic cells, because just like in the previous example, H2O will show up as our strongest OA or strongest RA at times. So when I look at all of my species, my strongest RA is my lead, and my strongest OA is my cobalt 2 plus. When we talk about the reaction that happens at the cathode, in the cathode is the site of reduction, red cat. Reduction is going to happen to my strongest OA. So my strongest OA is going to be reduced at the cathode. So at the cathode, I should be forming cobalt. At my anode, that's the site of oxidation, my strongest reducing agent is going to be oxidized. So at my cathode, my lead is going to be oxidized into lead 2 plus and 2 electrons. I don't need to change anything to get the overall cell rea reaction. I just cancel the electrons. If I want to find the minimum voltage, so that's asking what is the E cell. So that's the electric potential of my cathode minus the electric potential of my anode. So my cathode reaction on my data booklet is negative 0 0.28 volts minus my anode, which is negative 0 0.13 volts. So negative 0.28 minus negative 0.13 gives me a difference of negative 0 0.15 volts. So I need at least 
6.15 volts for that cell to happen. Some other things to note with this cell. So if we were to look at it, so there's a power supply in the middle. One side negative, one side positive. We have this other lead electrode. There's no porous barrier. If we were to look at this, so if this is my, the one on the left is my cathode and the one on the right is my anode. So these are both lead electrodes. Our reactions tell us what's gonna happen. One of these electrodes is gonna change in mass. Now it's not gonna be the cathode because lead is not involved there, but at the anode, so if this is my anode side, this electrode is going to decrease in mass because lead is forming lead ions. At my cathode, what I should observe is this cobalt solid is gonna be formed. So it's probably gonna be gaining mass, but it's not gonna be gaining lead. There's gonna be cobalt building up on the outside. I can identify that from this reaction. Questions we do, we're just using our strongest RA, strongest OA, same thing we've been doing in this course. Now there is an anomaly that we do need to be familiar with. Uh, and this it happens with the electrolysis of sodium chloride. In the first example, we had copper electrodes, so it was not the chloride anomaly. You'll notice here that we have copper electrodes, which are, are sorry, carbon electrodes, which are inert electrodes. So they're not actually involved in the chemistry of this cell. When I predict what's going to happen, my strongest OA and my strongest RA is H2O. That's what I predict is going to happen just based off of where they are in the chart. Now, this is the chloride anomaly. So what we do need to understand is any time we try to do the electrolysis with inert electrodes of a some type of chloride solution, we are going to produce chlorine gas. So even though we predict that, what actually happens, so I still I have my sodium ions, my chloride ions, and my H2O. We predict that my H2O is my strongest OA and my strongest RA. However, in reality, and this is just something we need to memorize, in reality, the thing that is oxidized is the chloride ion. So my strongest RA is actually the chloride ion. That's the thing that loses the electrons. My strongest OA is still the H2O. If you were to try to do this at home, it could be dangerous. I think there was a junior high teacher who had a story about doing this experiment and then going unconscious because he made mustard gas. That's the chlorine gas that is being produced. So what actually happens at the anode is that we have these two chloride ions, they lose electrons and make chlorine gas. That chlorine gas can be dangerous. Um, and, and that's kind of the story that the junior high teacher had. Uh, so that's what actually happens. So, so this is an example of the predicted reactions not always occurring, and this is the exception to the rule. Uh, so most of the... However, we do need to understand that there is an exception if we have a some type, so it can be potassium chloride or sodium chloride, if we have some type of chloride solution, an H2O, with inert electrodes. So this is different than the first example because these electrodes are inert. Uh, the rule is that the chloride ion will be oxidized. So that's this week. Um, and that is a summary of electrolytic cells using the same tools we had uh, that we've been using in the first unit. Uh, but now we're looking at cells without a porous barrier where we can use electrical energy to do some type of interesting chemical work.